Okay, we have reached module eight, the boring but critical admin stuff. So the stuff, that's my professional word for the long list of activities you need to do to protect the hard work of establishing your business right from the beginning. So when you finish this module, you will be ready to implement the, finish the implementation of your activity action items list, build your business, launch your business, stand on the starting line for your grand opening, whether it be physical business or a digital one. So in the last module, just to recap, in module seven, we covered the good, bad, and ugly realities of using social media. Now, social media is a valuable marketing and promotional tool, but everyone needs to be aware of its excesses, especially negative commentaries and bad advice. And that module, module seven and module six, just before it, were really to set you up to have all those issues and ideas in mind as we move forward now into this module, module eight. This is really where your typical or traditional how to start a small business advice starts. Uh, we believe, but we believe you now you are much better equipped to tackle the official administrative tasks for setting up a small business now that you have gone through the earlier ready entrepreneur practices. The boring but critical admin stuff is your final, not your first checklist before you start implementing all the activities you have defined in your act plan. But remember, in this module, we do not have a complete list of all activities required for every business in every jurisdiction. You must check your local requirements. Do not ignore these details. This module is really about going through pretty good overview of examples of the boxes that you need to check at a minimum what we would say would be in your first year of operation or maybe your first tax year of operation, whichever is applicable to your situation. So we will cover the possible admin areas to consider with a checklist of typical mandatory startup requirements. We'll talk about external financing because we know many of you are still thinking, I don't have the money to start my business. Um, and we'll talk about as a bonus market research for the business plan. And this time we do mean the official business plan. And the fine print on this module specifically says, this information is not legal advice. It's not to be construed as legal advice. It's not to be considered legal advice. As we've said, and as we will say many, many, many times, you have to check your local legal and regulatory requirements. So given that, you probably understand that the fastest way to establish your administrative setup, we assume would be, no doubt to make a do by delegate decision and pay a professional to do all the paperwork for you. So if you want to spend your money on legal services to set up the administrative infrastructure for your business, that may be your best option depending on how you want to approach that. But you still have to remember, you need to understand the business structure that is established for your business. We assume you are the name on the business and you are responsible for it regardless of who did the paperwork. So even if you plan to pay someone to do all this stuff, make sure you understand what you are paying them to do and use this checklist to confirm all of your concerns have been met. So what is the checklist? What's, what's the boring but critical admin stuff? Well, here's one possibility and I'll go through it very quickly because we'll get into the details in a minute. The business plan, which we'll talk about, registration, trademarks, incorporation, taxes, accounting, financial management, leases, licenses, permits, contracts, insurance, IP protection, good governance, conflict of interest, employee rights, consumer rights, privacy policy, financing. That's one example. There could be many, many others on your list, again, depending on where you live. Some requirements apply to all businesses, others only to your particular business or industry. To find out your requirements, you check with your local resources and you find the information pro provided to small business owners and to new businesses. Remember, you may have to check at every jurisdictional level. For example, your national, regional, state, provincial, municipal, district, they all may have regulations that apply to your type of business. And depending on the business, you may have professional or industry regulations or, or best practices set by organizations. And those rules are further determined by government regulations. So here are three steps for kind of thinking through this and for checking what it means to check your local requirements. Determine which levels of government have jurisdiction for your industry or location. And then check your, with your local resource authorities and check for business or industry official practices. Now, 
Some examples of resources in your area, which may have different but similar names, include like a federal level small business administration or department, national small business organizations, state business and industry departments, state business registration, local chambers of commerce, local small business resource centers, and local libraries. Now you'll be creating your own list of admin actions, but we'll go through some of these basic concepts. And I know some of you may be thinking, wait, 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 <laughs> I really need help here. This is the one place where I need to know exactly what I have to do technically, administratively to get my business up and running. And you do, that's true. The admin stuff is important. And that's why we are encouraging you to use your local resources because there's no other way to approach it when we're uh, doing a program like this. If you look at the Q&A or the FAQ for admin stuff sheet, which is at the end of uh, this module, you'll find some more detailed explanations about how to approach these activities. But again, you will not find information specific to your location or business. So watch out for the snowplow here too. Every aspect of your specific business can have unique variables and copying a plan from another business in your area may not cover all activities you need to do. And by the way, if you have no idea what I mean by watch out for the snowplow, jump over to module four, where we talk about copying other entrepreneurs approaches verbatim. You may end up with items you do not need, like a snowplow in a tropical country. So make sure you address the requirements for your business in your industry, in your location. Even, for example, revenue projections. It's not just about the legal structure, but when you go to do a business plan and want to create revenue projections, it still needs to be based on your market and your regulations governing your market because uh, you need to know how you can sell to your customers and how much you can charge. That's very specific information. So even guidance on something like projecting your revenues is localized. I'm confident uh, you understand that limitation. And of course, we'll keep mentioning it as we go through. There are different rules that apply to different businesses for different reasons. So nothing applies to everyone. You could live in a, lo in a location which does not require one or all of the items on the checklist that we're going to go through. But in most cases, these suggestions are probably a good place to start. So let's go through them one by one. We're going to cover some of the general issues to think about in the areas of business structure, intellectual property, finance, technology, legal, governance, employee, and consumer rights. So let's get started on the checkboxes. We'll start with the business structure, which is how do you administratively organize your business? And that's the paperwork of the business itself. Registration. Most locations require all businesses to be registered. And in most cases, this is for tax purposes. So to avoid bureaucratic delays, this step should be completed as soon as you are certain you're moving forward. I'm guessing in most jurisdictions, you have to pay a fee. So you want to make sure you do this at the point, you know, when, when you're ready to, to get, you're absolutely certain you're going to go forward and open your business. Incorporation, that's the legal structure of a business, um, depending again on, on local requirements. That's a decision that typically affects taxes and registration, and that's a separate decision you have to make. And then insurance, the amount and type of insurance you need is based on your business and various other requirements, but you should look into it. Again, you don't want some sort of last minute snag to disrupt the whole plan that you've been mapping out this entire time. Intellectual property. So intellectual property protection or IP, that's for originally created ideas. And that works both ways. That's protection for you and your original IP. And it's protection against you and anyone else that wants to use someone else's IP. So if you use someone else's designs, words, or other created product in your business to be part of your advertising or in your product or in any way that you use to earn money, to earn revenue, you may be violating someone else's IP rights. So you must get permission. Many products like images are online, are available for free and have an open license, Creative Commons agreement, but read the rules carefully and keep a copy of the rules you use when you made use of the product and the date that, that those rules apply to as well. Trademarks. So if you create something original, including your business or product name, you might want to look at trademark protection. Be careful about using another product's trademarks for any reason, including in your advertising and commercial presentations or on your website, because it, it might imply an endorsement by another company that 
doesn't even know who you are. Um, also, if you're using images from you know, free to use websites and things like that, where they say, yeah, go ahead, it's cool. Remember, if there are logos or trademarks in the image, those trademarks are possibly not free to use on a commercial site. So the image might be free to use because the person who took that picture gave up the rights, but the trademarks in the picture may not have been cleared. So again, be careful about the use of a particular product, even if it says free to use. Just be very careful about using other people's intellectual property. All right, the financial issues, taxes. So if you are earning revenue, even $1, you may have to claim the amount on your taxes. So check your federal, state, provincial, all the loca applicable locations for tax filing requirements, and be prepared to independently make tax payments throughout the year, even if you are unable to accurately predict your annual earnings. So in your first year of operating, you might be making money, but you don't know how much it's going to be. But in some places, if you don't pay at least some taxes during the year, um, there can be a penalty for that. Counting. So maintaining professional bookkeeping from the beginning will help keep you organized as the business grows. And a professional should help you organize your expenses and manage receipts for tax filing and other purposes. And proper accounting is also important just for running your business so you understand where you're spending money. The money practices that we went through do not just apply to you personally, it applies to your business as well. Financial management. If you're directly collecting payments from the public, you'll need to consider how your financial management systems will work. So you will need to manage cash, credit cards, you need processes set up with your bank and an online payment system. So make sure you have that all organized. You do want to get paid. So <laughs> that's one of the most important things that you should organize up front is how do you collect uh, from the public, uh, from your customers, and how do you keep that organized? All right, technology. This is an area that actually a lot of um, traditional how to start a small business advice overlooks, but this is the tech age and these issues are important for your internal business and for your customers. Your entire technology infrastructure should be protected behind a firewall, just like you have at home. And if you have customer facing technology systems, remember your customers are trusting you with their personal data and you are responsible for it. So consider privacy for your customer data, customer data and all the anti-hacking software you know, to protect your business servers. Now you might be thinking, oh, it's just a small business and, and you know, that's, that seems like a lot, but definitely get it set up in the beginning. You must have basic security in place because again, you're, you're, you have customer information, especially if you end up collecting credit card information, things like that. So every online system you set up for your business should be security protected. You should always confirm that whenever you set up some kind of uh, online system that is customer facing and for your employees as well. All right, legal issues. Depending on your business, you may need special permits or licenses to operate, or you may need to rent space from third parties or hire people. So all of those documents, all of those processes should be properly created by professionals. Um, leases, I'll just go through these quickly. If you need leases, read the terms carefully. If you're unable to operate your business but have a long-term lease, you may end up being stuck with a property. Contracts, you know, both sides should understand all contract terms, even if you are working with partners, friends or family. Um, any activity involving money or any kind of long time frame work commitment should be governed by a formal agreement. Licenses and permits, you have to check the local requirements on that. And inspections, um, you know, some businesses have to be inspected before being allowed to begin operating. So make sure you confirm that before you open your doors or you might not be able to open the doors. All right, good governance. Now, good governance refers to your management policy. So the way you run your business internally. And these should always be put in place for your business right from the beginning, regardless if you're starting even with you, just one person, or you know, at least if, definitely if you have uh, two or more. Some of these policies are required by lenders as an indication that the business has you know, set up basic ground rules for its employees. Um, and these policies include, but are not limited to, conflict of interest. So this is a, a policy that provides employees with guidelines to avoid accusations of bias and favoritism in hiring and other decisions. Document retention, that's for employees to understand when business documents must be maintained for tax or legal purposes and when documents can be destroyed. So that's the famous, when can I go to the shredder uh, <laughs> situation. You don't want people to do that when they shouldn't. Uh, the, so many documents now, of course, are digital. So you should think about a process actually for preserving or printing those documents that you should be maintaining. The most important documents 
paper, you know, you should still make a paper copy. That's still uh, what people, you know, that's the more viable option. Privacy. Now you need to have actually internal and external privacy. Inter and that's by that we mean privacy controls and privacy policies. Internally, you have to protect your employee information and have systems in place to prevent leaks of employee personal information. And externally, the business must also protect customer information and prevent third parties from obtaining your customer in customer information like the credit card numbers. So the, and the external or customer information privacy policy may also be made available to customers through your website so people can see that and you're very transparent about it. And harassment. Many jurisdictions re require that any person managing other people undergo workplace harassment awareness and training. So depending on the size of your business, these regulations may apply to you. And at the very least, you may want to have a policy in place if you have a lot of employees and, or people managing other people. That brings us to employee rights. If you are hiring employees, you must meet all the regulations protecting workers, including those covering workers' safety, benefits, non-discrimination, and anything else that's applicable in your jurisdiction. And there are consumer rights also. Depending on your business, you may have specific obligations to any customer who enters your building or purchases your product or service. For example, there could be requirements that apply to you for product safety, product quality, um, store or building access regulations, and non-discrimination. So this is not a complete list by any means. And for it doesn't apply to any one business in any one location. It, some or all these issues may apply to you. But did I mention <laughs> that knowing what, what works, what's important for your business and what isn't um, is, more, is critical? To your business it's critical to making sure you do things properly and get things set up correctly so as we stated from the beginning find your local resources to help you identify the official formal small business startup requirements in your jurisdiction okay so we've completed video one of module eight and we've covered the possible startup requirements and pos possible actions to consider when completing all that boring but critical admin stuff and we presented a suggested, preliminary, incomplete, non-specific checklist of admin stuff you may typically have to do for a new business. So in summary, you must find out your local requirements for actions around how to set up your business structure, what's required, intellectual property protection, finance processes, technology, infrastructure, legal requirements, governance, employee rights, and consumer rights and any other detail required by law in your jurisdiction, in your location. Okay, the ready entrepreneur practice for admin stuff is to research and comply with the applicable laws and regulations before you open your door or your, open your website. So your hard work must be protected by ensuring your business complies with applicable laws and regulations. I think we've made the point I think you understand the details. That's another story, but we under, we're confident you'll, you'll find out what you need to do. So moving on. If you are intending to apply for external funding for your business, and this is the point where you need to consider your official business plan. And external funding can mean in any way, which we'll talk about the different types of lenders, but this is the point where third parties are going to ask to see official documentation of what the business is that you're trying to build. So as you may expect, the information from all the admin stuff, due diligence can, and in many cases should be incorporated into your formal business plan document. So in the next video, we will cover three factors about external financing that you should understand before moving forward. The types of lenders, insiders, outsiders, and angels, loans versus equity shares, and financing restrictions. We'll see you in video two. Okay, this is Ready Entrepreneur Module 8, Video 2, on the boring but critical admin stuff, the importance of protecting your hard work from the beginning. And one of the reasons, well, there are many reasons, but one of them is because some of you are going to be pursuing external financing. So this section focuses on finding money from external sources after you've gone as far as you can go with your own resources, after you've actually exhausted every single one of the money finding practices we had 
for you back in module three. Now you need to go externally because you know you need additional funds to get your business to the starting line. So to get ready to face external funding store sources, let's set the stage for how prepared you are as a ready entrepreneur at this point in the process. If you started the course modules from the beginning, here's where we are. In module one, we focused on fueling you up with the confidence you want to move forward with your dream of starting your own business. So you know you can start and run your own business. In module two, we found you the time. You said you didn't have any time to work on your business. We found you the time you could be spending on your entrepreneurial dreams from the time that you have within your day. In module three, we found the money. We helped you identify money to cover at least the initial expenses or even all of the costs of getting your business started. So now after tracking your spending, you've found those extra dollars and you've put them into the business and you've invested in your hope. In module four, we moved on to strategy, research, and planning. And we set up your act or your action items activity list for understanding how to actually bring your business to the starting line. This is the real, the real activities, the real actions that need to be done to get that business open. So now you've carefully thought through every activity you need, need to do for your business to become the success you envision. You have an active, constantly updating act list and you're using the time practices from module two, whenever you set aside even 10 or 15 minutes to work on your business, you use your list, you go through the next activity that needs to be accomplished, you implement it and you get it done. In module five, we covered how to decide who will do the work. Should you do, buy, or delegate each action item? So now you know the work you will do and the work you need others to do and you hopefully were able to estimate the cost of starting up your business. This is what we're going to talk about now in this particular video. And you've estimated how much of your own time will also be needed. So you actually will have some good estimates, some good ideas about where, or where you need to spend additional funds to get your business launched. In module six and seven, we talked about online resources, using the internet and managing social media. And that was in preparation for how you will go forward now with the items you need to cover in this module eight. So in the last video for module eight, we focused on the administrative action items you might need to cover as part of your business launch. To recap, in every location where you want to operate your business, you need to confirm the legal and practical requirements necessary for the successful operation of your business. And this may include business structure, intellectual property, finance, technology, legal, governance, employee rights, and consumer rights. And for many of you, these admin details will include creating a formal business plan. The business plan is a document often created for external funders. So it's a document you prepare so you can show other people what you've done to create your business. But before you consider asking others for money, you should consider the full scope of your request. So in this video, we're going to cover this whole issue of external financing, finding the money you want from other resources. So we'll cover the types of lenders, loans versus equity, and possible restrictions you might run up against. All right, finding external financing for your business could be the key action needed to complete your list. We're very well aware of that. You want to get your doors open, you want to get your website set up, you had actual costs associated to starting the business, which you could not pull out of the money that money finding practices we identified in module three. So now you need to go and out into the world and see if there is support for your business and additional funds that you can tap into. Some of you may even have already started borrowing from family and friends, but the costs now are higher than what they are able to cover for you. So if your business requires major financing, you would have to become involved in completing the documentation re requirements for the lending institution or organization or individual who is prepared to finance your business. And usually this documentation will include the requirement for a business plan. And this time we mean the official formal documented business plan. 
Now, for the most part, there are local resources that can help you to prepare a business plan. And by local resources, I mean like your local small business center or small business administration office. And a business plan may or may not be legally required for other purposes. Sometimes it's, it could be required for registration or something like that. But the document is almost certainly going to be expected if you wish to present your business ideas to potential external investors. In general, people are always looking for the documented business story. So what is the business plan? The business plan is an outline of the business idea and value proposition with specifics about how you intend to run the business and market your product or service to customers. So in general, third parties want to know very basically, very directly, how are you going to make money? If they're lending you money, they want to know how you're going to make money to pay it back. And these resources want this information presented in a specific format that they understand. So the business plan typically includes your business idea, the market or consumer opportunity, the management or operational structure and organization, marketing and promotion ideas, your revenue projections and your financing requirements. And as we said before, if you've gone through all of the other Ready Entrepreneur modules by now, you should have pretty good idea of how you're going to fill in this document, this information in in your business plan document. So you can also think about if you're not going for financing for third parties and whether or not you want to create a business plan document to aggregate all of the work you've done so far and have it ready if you just in case you need it. Not a step you need to do if you're not pursuing any work with third parties, but it is a good way to bring together all the information and all the work that you have done previously in the other modules. Having the business plan complete is a a valuable step in the process because it allows you to lay out your entire story of the business. But again, we don't do busy work at Ready Entrepreneur. We don't do things just, um, just because it would be nice to do them. So if you're not accessing external resources, if you're not asking anyone for outside assistance or outside funding, and your business is already set to go, you don't need a formal business plan. Um, and again, you have to remember why you're doing the work at all times. You, you don't want to be doing work just because somewhere on a list it said, create a business plan. Okay, so preparing the business plan is an action item you generally do for lenders, as we've said. But what do you do for yourself when you're looking for funding? And by that we mean, what are you thinking about for protecting you? In any agreement with another entity to fund your business in exchange for value, make sure you are comfortable with the fine print. Make sure you understand the agreement that you have made. So in general, let's talk about lenders first. They're basically three buckets of lenders, let's call them, who may be willing to support your business and each will have different reasons for their participation. So we'll cover the insiders, those are the family and friends, the outsiders, those are institutions, organizations, banks, lending organizations, and then the angels or the philanthropists. And here's what to think about when you're approaching the different kinds of lenders. You start with family and friends. Now, That might be the easiest place to start, but you have to be aware of where you can run into trouble. Family and friends may be generous and loan or give you money to start your business, but watch out for hidden strings, whether intended or not, that are attached to the loan, such as an expectation to pay the money back at a particular time, a specific date that maybe is not openly articulated, or an exchange of free products or services as your business grows. Maybe people think that if they've lent you the money to start the business, they'll always get free products and services out of it. And the, the loaner's desire to be part of the business. Some people think that lending you money means that they own the business, and that's not technically true. So you have to make sure to avoid conflict in the future that you set up the terms and the expectations with family and friends as dis- diligently as you would with any kind of formal lender. All right, let's talk about the institutions, financial institutions such as banks and cooperatives. They lend money to make money. So they provide transparent rules, but much less flexibility with their lending. Many are public companies. They must meet shareholder expectations and they face government regulation. So you can obtain a lending institution, small business financing information and compare their rules and their parameters and restrictions and so on to determine if you are comfortable with the terms for receiving a loan from a particular institution. 
but strict rules can also mean low acceptance rates for new ideas. So all the work you've done so far to create the vision of your business and all of the planning and the thinking that you've done and what exactly it would take to set up your business, your act list and so on, that will help you to show that you're serious and this is ready to go and you've done the research and you're prepared. All right, the angel investors or the philanthropists, venture capitalists, benefactors, private funds, social entrepreneurship organizations, and other similar types of lending programs. Now, their motivations really depend on the program or the person. Uh, many of them, of course, support economic development for underserved people or underserved areas. Some people are simply interested in a good idea and they want to invest in good ideas. But despite their mission, many of these programs are still governed by restrictive lending rules, this time set by their own donors. So the people who are lending the money still have an idea in their minds about what the rules are for lending that money. So make sure you understand their constraints, especially around things like interest rates and payback terms. It's almost like the family and friends, like don't just assume because an organization is dedicated to helping end poverty in a region or something like that, that they don't have rules. They will have rules also, and you have to be aware of what those rules are. All right, let's look at loans versus equity. Now, when you receive money, the other party may be extending the money to you in exchange for payback terms or a share in the equity of your business. So payback terms are your standard loan, you're granted a sum of money and you must make regular payments of a fixed amount. So the loan is governed by specific rules and regulations and supported by your actual business. That's the collateral and all the business's value. So your risk in this situation is if you run out of cash and cannot make a payment, your business may end up in the hands of the lender. So that's what you have to think about when you're applying for a loan. Equity shares essentially mean the lender has bought a percentage ownership of your business. So you receive the money, but you give up a share of business of the business. And in this case, you do not have to make any regular payments, which can help if you have a cash flow issue, but you run the risk of losing control of the business. If your share of ownership falls below 50% or any other amount you agree to with the lender, you could be out of luck. But remember, in an equity agreement, you can actually set up all of the terms of the agreement, not just the percentage of ownership, but what they call voting rights and decision-making rules and so on. So you must decide if you want to give up some of the ownership of your business or some of the rules or some of the decision-making, any kind of deal, any kind of deal around control of the business, you, want, you have to decide if you want to give that up in exchange for money or whether you prefer to make payments on a loan. And if you're giving up ownership because of the possibility of losing control of your business, then you have to be very clear about what point you could vary when you quickly end up, you know, with 51% or more that ends up in control of controlling shares in the hands of somebody else. So if you continuously use equity as a financing strategy, make sure that all the rules line up. So that if you've done it more than once, you don't realize one day that all the equity agreements you've made add up to somebody else controlling more than half the, of the shares in your business. Okay, what are some of the restrictions? One uh, of the strings attached, there's always got to be strings, right? In almost all cases, money from third parties will only be extended with the strings attached such as a required payback period. And again, that applies even if you get a loan from a family member, make sure you find out if they want that money back in a, within a specific time period. Management control is a big one. That's where you have the equity issue. Maybe some people who have a share in your business also have a share of the management control. And then the things like approval for marketing and promotion decisions. Sometimes that's the string that people want. They want to have they love your idea, but they want to have a piece of controlling it, of, promote, of promoting it, of making it viable, and that might be a problem for you. So you'll have to incorporate these restrictions into your business governance and accept any constraints the restrictions may imply. External financing is often a difficult decision for small business entrepreneurs and who believe that you know, you've completely pre prepared for investor concerns that you're set up and you're ready and you're the entrepreneur and they should just give you the money late and let you run with it. Um, and also, or 
you, sometimes you know you, you have the perfect presentation you lay out everything exactly as as expected and then you get turned down for funding there are many 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 organizations engaged in funding small business and your best shot at attracting their attention is to be ready for all angles of questions because you've carefully thought through all aspects of your business and maybe even started with your own resources and now you are set for growth. And what does that sound like? That sounds like you've completed all the other modules in Ready Entrepreneur. So you are set to face external financing people, answer all their questions. You've thought through every aspect of your business. You're in a much better position than people who go in cold and aren't quite sure what to say. The Ready Entrepreneur practice for pursuing external financing is to be prepared to present a formal business plan, decide which lenders you will pursue, insiders, outsiders, or angels, decide whether to request a loan or give up an equity share, and understand all your lender's restrictions and limitations. And that's every kind of lender you're talking about. Always understand the restrictions, limitations, expectations. Okay, to recap, we've just covered all those issues in this video lenders loans equity and restrictions now a typical business plan likely includes information from all the admin due diligence we covered in video one of this module which will be incorporated into your business plan and as we mentioned in earlier modules a typical business plan also includes information about your potential consumer market so to help you prepare the business plan the consumer information and market information section of the plan. In the next video, we've included some bonus information to do a deeper dive into market research for your product or service. Your business plan will almost certainly include market research about your business and value proposition for the assessment of third party lenders. So how do you get to that research? In video three, we're going to cover why you need market research, research options, real, instinctual, or anecdotal, and research limitations. And we'll go back and remind you about the big company examples we talked about in Module 1. So we'll see you in Module 8, Video 3, Market Research for the Business Plan. Okay, we've made it to Module 8, Video 3. This is bonus material on the boring but critical admin stuff, the importance of protecting your hard work from the beginning. We're going to talk about finding and using market research for your business plan. So in the last video, we covered the benefits and limitations of external financing. We end by understanding who are all the different types of lenders, what's a loan versus what's equity share in your company, and the possible restrictions and limitations that come up with financing. And repeating again, because we're gonna keep repeating it, in every location where you want to operate your business, you need to confirm the legal and practical requirements necessary for the successful operation of your business. And that includes everything related to external financing, loans, credits, uh, equity share regulations, and so on. Now, back in module four, uh, when you were planning and strategizing about your business idea and creating your act list, we asked you to write a couple of lines of what could ultimately be the first page of a formal business plan. So you may recall those lines were, my business idea is, and you fill in your business idea, and my business value proposition is, and you fill in your business value proposition. And for those of you who don't have an idea yet, or you haven't settled on one of the hundreds of ideas in your mind, we said, just follow the example set by our ready entrepreneur avatar, and it'd give you an idea of how you would fill this part in. And, but we said you know, also that you must create in your mind a vision of what that business ultimately looks like and what, it, what success means to you. So in this video, we're going to cover the market research around validating your business idea and business proposition. And this is information that you would put into your business plan and also you would have for yourself. It will be basically for you, like the foundation around why you decided to move forward with your business idea. So we'll talk about why you need market research, research options, and there are a few, the real re or instinctual or anecdotal, and research limitations and reminders from the big company examples we talked about in module one. So let's get started. Why do you need market research? The market research section of your business plan is typically scrutinized by third parties and investors who want to understand your business idea. So although few major companies got their start by doing detailed market research analysis at the idea stage of what ended up being 
a world-changing product or service. New entrepreneurs who often do not have access to personal you know, information, resources, and so on, they are told that they have to meet the business plan requirement to obtain any type of third-party assistance. So in other words, if you have money, you can just run with your business idea. And if you don't have money, you have to follow other people's rules. So because of external funders and business assistants and financial in investors, whether public or private sources, they generally need to justify their investment to someone else. That's why you have to do the paperwork. They need that information for their own funders. So that paperwork is specifically a business plan outlining why the business is a good idea and market research showing there's a need or demand for the business. They need to know how you plan to make money. And without those documents, few funders would move forward with a brand new business. There are, of course, angel investors or people who just like a good idea who will invest without documentation, but you have to find those people or they have to find you. So that is one of the reasons why so many new businesses have to start with funding from family and friends, because many small business owners, when they're just starting out, they don't want to spend money on extensive market research, nor, nor can they, you formally justify your business idea. You just know it's a good idea. So you rely on your own resources until your business is up and running and attracting customers. And then you go to external funders who can help grow the business after viewing the market details that you have documented from the beginning. So we don't want to get hung up on market research as another reason to delay starting your business. But if you're ready to talk to outside investors, you need to be able to explain why you think you have a unique business value proposition. So let's start research there. We're going to look at three types of market research, real, instinctual, and anecdotal. All right, so real research, and I'm putting that in air quotes, is professional market research. It can be conducted in many ways. And as we define it, this is a great idea for your business if you can manage to cover the cost. Professionals have detailed information about consumers in your target marketplace, and they can conduct market surveys, questionnaires, you know, taste analysis if you have a consumable product, product position testing against the competition, and other experiments to gauge consumer reaction to new products or services. So they do a very formal setup for this process. But no research is perfect, <laughs> and human beings are notoriously difficult to predict. So again, don't get hung up on thinking you're going to have to hire somebody to go out and do a bunch of fancy surveys and position testing and competitor uh, comparisons. And, and here's why. Because multi-billion dollar industries with huge marketing and research departments often fail with new products because the pump public simply rejects the idea. Or the public likes the idea, but not the way the product is presented. So if, you, if you're old enough to remember the battle between Betamax and VHS tapes, which VHS won, you will know that there's a product that can be presented. It was presented to the market, the Betamax tape, a better quality version of the same technology, but it's not the market favorite, so it simply lost the race. And another example, which is basically the euphemism for disastrous product launch and marketing failures in 1985 when Coca-Cola introduced New Coke. The Coca-Cola, of course, is the Coca-Cola company is the one of the biggest marketing machines in the world. But people literally ended up pouring a new cloak down sewer drains and spend this. So spending millions of dollars on marketing and research will not guarantee you a successful product. But as we mentioned, you usually have to provide formal market research documentation to outside funders. So if you pay to have the research conducted and the results are not favorable, do not be discouraged or rely only on the numbers. Great market research results are no guarantee of success and bad results are no guarantee of failure. If you're conducting real research for an investor, make sure you are specific about the market you want to target, the type of atmosphere and context you want the product to be tested in, and the questions you want to ask. And by that, we say, you know, you want questions to validate your, bus your, your business value proposition. And, and for example, going back to our Ready Entrepreneur Avatars Rees case, you want to know whether consumers find the lack of a donut hole fun 
and whether they find the product delicious. So you don't want questions that ask something like, do you prefer to eat ice cream? Because people may say yes, even if they love donuts. You know, they'll say, oh yeah, I prefer to eat ice cream to a donut, but they might be enjoying the donut. So you need to be certain that the questions are getting to the answers that you want the, the answers you want answered <laughs> and that, if that makes any sense you don't want to be leap throw make leave the questions up in the air you want them to be pretty specific but you can't be restrictive in this approach of course you cannot manipulate the questions to obtain the results you want uh, prof and a professional market researcher should have pretty good ideas and other angles to try and should know how to do this you know off the top of their heads for example, they could look at focusing on the novelty aspect of a new donut and asking if customers would buy samples as a gift. Like That's the type of questions that you'd want to see that somebody was capable of doing if you were hiring a professional. When the work is done, consider the results. Weigh whether the research captured the type of consumer you wanted to research and takes the results as you see them. You may decide to make a major decision based on the research, but first review the results carefully. Now, market research as a profession generally, generally looks for your potential consumer, whether there is any, any existing tr interest or trends and the competitive landscape. And not just direct, but indirect competitors as well. But just as you would not allow people around you to discourage you from your business idea, do not let market researchers narrowly view the potential of your business. Remember from module one, we gave you four examples of big market ideas that may not have been what people assumed they were when the business founder for, first proposed the concept. So in summary, those examples were the coffee shop that was really a European dr coffee drinking experience and the mobile communication device that came to you instead of you going to it, the package delivery service that was both a valuable premium service for some and a bargain for others, and the airline that just wanted to transport people. Ask yourself, would traditional research have captured these explosive gaps in the market? You know what all these companies are. So would traditional research have captured that before these companies were viable? Maybe not. So you have to be careful about what the research is telling you and how you want to use it. And this applies not just to mega companies. It applies to your idea for your kind of coffee shop and on one street corner in your small town or to your boutique shop or to your online business. So think about how that research is going to be used. Now, depending on your product, you may also be able to do real formal research on your own. For example, for Ree's Donut business, remember the value pop proposition was based on uniqueness and yumminess. So why does Ree think those two qualities are valuable? Because people have told her they like the donuts. But all the people who have previously commented on the donuts were family and friends, so maybe they praise the product because they're trying to be nice. The real test for a plate of donuts is leave it out in a room and see if people eat them, right? So we could try that approach at work or at a community or recreation event and survey the people who are sampling the donut. Of course, if you're going to do this, you know, don't be annoying with people, but make sure you set it up in a way that doesn't totally disrupt their day. You document the location, time, and setting, the number of tasters and other parameters that may imply bias in your analysis. And remember, at this point, you are doing your own documentation, your own research. Ask all your potential customers the same questions each time. For example, do you like donuts without a hole? Do you think this donut tastes good? And then document the responses. You can utilize your own collected research if you prepare the data the same way a professional would. There's no problem with that. But again, be careful about presentation and perception of your new business. I once had cookies left on my doorstep by an emerging business and the packaging was cute and the cookies were in these open bags. They weren't individually wrapped and inside was a business card and, and a note that the business was starting up. But with no way of knowing really where the cookies came from, I did not want to try them. Maybe you think I'm too paranoid, but I just thought, you know, it's not a bad idea to randomly distribute your product for free. That's cool. But you might want to think about a more suitable setting than leaving food on people's doorsteps. It's better if they see you and they can understand what the business really is. Now, going building off of doing your own real research, you may want to skip the formal market research because you already know how popular your product or service is or could be. This non-formal approach to market research is anecdotal, which in general means the data is based on personal accounts, not facts or research. And there's nothing wrong with that. 
If you've received multiple offhand positive comments about the value of your idea, you may definitely be onto something. You personally can go forward with your business on the basis of anecdotal research, even if you have no product to test. The fact the idea seems to resonate could be enough. So document this feedback for yourself, including where you receive the feedback and in what context, and keep this evidence to help you validate your value proposition to third parties. With a warning, of course, that not all third parties are going to accept your anecdotal evidence, but at least you have it and you've thought about it. Now, you could also find support for your business idea based on your own experiences. What if you've not spoken to anyone? What if you have only personally observed a gap in the marketplace and think you may be able to fill it? Your reasoning will be similar. Why do you think there's a gap? Why would you be able to fill it? You know, there's a product out there called the Cronut. I'm not sure where the inventor of the Cronut first got the idea, but the product is a donut croissant crossover and people line up at the bakery to buy it. So if you're planning a donut store, you could see a phenomenon like that, the Cronut, and start independently brainstorming other donut innovations without a single person providing you feedback. And is this approach valid? Well, of course it is. It is. That's how we get so many great ideas in the world. You can use the justification of your own observations to support the idea. Document the observation that triggered your interest. So you're using, let's say, a competitor product as an example of what's possible. You can also note success by similar businesses or industries, small, big, however you find them. As you go through Ready Entrepreneur practices, you will be able to further vet your own ideas and maybe the implementation of the course tactics will shed more light on the viability of your business. So if you're comfortable sharing your business ideas, you can also ask other Ready Entrepreneurs for feedback through the comment section below or in the private Facebook group. All right, in fact, you know, Ready Entrepreneur loves business instincts by entrepreneurs because so many businesses started on just that spark the the great not just the great businesses not just the big ones you know about but all the little ones as well all your small town businesses it's got started because somebody noticed something and said this is an area where i can do the work and i want to run the business that fills this market gap so trust your own reasons for having your business idea in the first place you do not have to do formal surveys and formal market analysis but you want a customer base, you know, you, you, you want a customer base that you can define. Whatever circumstances gave you the idea for the business is likely where you'll find the base you're hoping to attract. It all rolls together. Okay, one last thought about research. If you want a quick overview of market trends and analysis for just about any product or service before you have even started to document research, of course, you can go online. Um, today, you know, searching online the internet is the fastest research anyone can do. Web search, use web searches for keywords or products related to your industry will bring up a lot of information. Forums for trends people are discussing will give you ideas. Consider government data resources, which often have public information about the sizes of industries and previous growth, growth over, you know, long term. And look at international sources. Um, this is a favorite resource of mine. I scan the headlines of international media sites, and I also look at the advertising on those sites to see if there's any trend I've never heard of. So you can document your online research for your business plan, although the information may not be sufficient for investors who specifically want to assess how your business idea is likely to fare in, in your market. It's a good start. And it demonstrates that you are serious about your business and looking at a range of options for validating your idea and that these, your idea is out there in the marketplace and the investors need to move quickly too if they want to catch, cash in on it. Okay, I hope this bonus material diving into market research was helpful in wrapping up your approach to the business plan. The ready entrepreneur practice for market research is to select a market research approach real, anecdotal, instinctual, all of the above. Document the research parameters, the context and atmosphere in which you gather the data. Document the same way a professional would. Document research results. Check for consistency in questions and diversity in audiences or customer bases. And review results carefully, considering all factors. So now in this video, 
We've covered why you need market research, the research options, and the research limitations. Remember the big company examples. Just because an idea does not readily appear in the marketplace right now does not mean it's not viable. All right, we've reached the end of module eight, the boring but critical admin stuff. And you have wandered deep online to pull up all the resources you need to make sure you check every box on your admin checklist. Manage the details for your business industry and location. Keep up with relevant requirements. And we repeat, because then we know you want to hear it one more time, the critical need to check your local jurisdiction laws and regulations. We want your business to launch and to thrive, to be there for years to come. In the next module, we are walking up to the starting line like this is it. It's, it's ready, set, go time. In module nine, we ask, are you ready? Are you set? Can you go with the launch of your new business? We will take another look at the path you took to earn a place in the starting lane and then ask, are you there? And how do you know you are ready? This is the home stretch, the final module, the starting line, which means you're on the track, you earned your place, you're dressed, you've got your gear, you're ready to go. Let's make it happen. See you in module nine.